Today is a day like any other, a day that began in darkness because the sun was absent, the earth rested, and creation was still. Today is a day just like any other, and yet a new day because the sun has returned and reawakened creation. 2,000 years ago, the world experienced a day unlike any other, the day that exceeded all expectations. We live and move and have our being in Him ever since that day, the day that began in the greatest darkness the world has ever known because the sun was absent. The earth grieved and creation mourned. God became a man. The king of the world became a servant. The giver and sustainer of life became obedient to death. All hope was lost. But then, a few of his followers awoke and were greeted by the unexpected. The angel told them, he is not here, he has risen. Today, we expect the unexpected because our Savior did the unexpected. He died and rose again, and God elevated him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is life, victory, and power in the name of Jesus. He is alive.
risen and he is alive. That is good news and it gives us a reason to celebrate. <laughs> oh, it is good to be together today on this day of celebration. Happy Easter, everyone. Throughout this morning, we are going to center on Jesus and on the fact that because he conquered death and he rose from the grave, that we get to experience life and life to the full. So to help us continue to center on him, we're going to read together from Ephesians chapter 1. So as the scripture appears on the screen, I invite you to read aloud with enthusiasm the parts that are labeled all in yellow. Let's read this together. All praise to God. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. From him and through him and to him are all things. He is so rich in his kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. From him and through him and to him are all things. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, and we are united with Christ. Amen. Let's sing of his goodness. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those walls are open now. That's good news, amen. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. So we sing, this is our God. And this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. And this is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, He's King Jesus Thank you, Lord Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But He heard every word, every whisper Cheers! 
So good. Thank you, choir, for being here with us today. It is a treat to have you with us. Sound beautiful. Oh, there's my wife. One of you is especially beautiful today. Uh, thanks for being here with us. You guys can have a seat. Oh, so good. We are just excited. We look forward to this celebration all year long. And I know we got a lot of people in from out of town and maybe you're here today at the invitation of a family member or a friend, maybe at the bribery of grandma and lunch. Whatever the reason you're here today, we want, we want to welcome you. You know, I got a real soft spot in my heart for those of you who might be here. And this maybe is that one time in the year when you come to church, or maybe that one time every five years, or maybe this is your first time ever. I've got a tender spot right there because... Uh, that used to be me, and I'm thankful I had, I had really loving, faithful parents, and so I grew up in a church home, and you know, as I got a little bit older, didn't really buy into all that Jesus stuff, I would still go back to church, to that home church with my folks on days like this on Easter, and I don't think this was true, but I always felt like I wasn't welcome. Nobody ever said that to me. Everyone's always really nice. But I felt like everybody knew I hadn't been in a really long time. And so if that's where you're at today, breathe easy. We don't take attendance. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hear me, uh, God's love for you is not based on your church attendance. Uh, we don't have an agenda for you. We don't want anything from you. We are genuinely and honestly just thankful that we get to spend a little bit of time together and to orient you to why we make such a big deal on Easter Sunday and why we all gather and fill rooms like this all over the world. It's because we believe Jesus came back from the dead and we celebrate that. We celebrate that reality. So if you're here today at the request or the invitation of somebody else and you're not on board with all of that, that's okay. You're welcome here, but give us a little bit of room to hoop and holler and have fun and to sing, and we're going to center in on some, some narratives about the life and ministry of Jesus right there in the resurrection, and, and that's why we're doing it. We're doing it to celebrate, so give us a little bit of room, and to all of the Christians in the room, it's a pretty good bet. You know, it's Easter Sunday, and it's Sunday morning. It's a pretty good bet there's some Christians in the room. <laughs> I feel it's a safe assumption. I want you to think about maybe giving some of the people in your life a little bit of room too. And those who may not believe what you believe, who aren't celebrating in the way that you're celebrating, who may not make a big deal, that maybe had to come with a little bit of bribery, or you felt like you had to drag your kid out of bed, or you had to drag yourself here to the 830 service. I know a lot of you are not sitting in your normal seats this morning. Thank you for that. I want you to give some, some room to the other people who, na who may not be where you are. It's important that we meet people where they are. That's exactly what Jesus did. And I think sometimes, and I'll speak directly to the faith community, we want so desperately for other people to believe. We want them to experience what we've experienced. And maybe we share our faith or we share a story, we share some truth that means a lot to us and it just, it doesn't seem to land with them. Let's continue to meet them in that place. Sometimes when people don't meet our expectations, that's when we stop listening. That's when we stop loving. Let's be, let's be honest with that. And, and that's not real helpful. And so, you know, if you can imagine, one of the most beautiful things that the resurrection of Jesus teaches us and shows us is Jesus met people right where they were. And we're going to see that over and over again today as we walk through the resurrection narratives. We're going to see him literally do that. So here's my Easter encouragement. Whether you're a follower of Jesus, whether you're a skeptic, whether you're on the fence, let's, let's, just, let's just consider meeting people where they are. I remember in my doubts and in my skepticisms, in my unbelief, 
all that Jesus talk, man, that rubbed me wrong. Like it was a repellent when people were trying to show or to share love with me. And I, I got a lot of stories right there that I'll say for another time. But I'm thankful that that's where he met me. And I'm thankful for people who also met me in that place. And that actually is one of the central truths of the Easter story. And it's what we're going to focus in on, especially today. And so when we talk about Jesus coming back from the dead, we're actually going to go into four different books in the New Testament known as the gospel narratives. And these are four biographical sketches of the life and ministry of Jesus. And they're written by different authors at slightly different times, two different audiences for different reasons, but they all paint this beautiful picture of Jesus like a, like a mural or a stained glass. I'm going to put this up here. This is what, I would say, this is actually what the scriptures as a whole do. The scriptures, 66 books in the scriptures. That's a library of scripture, and it all is this unified story that points us right to Jesus. But if we focus just over here, we might not necessarily see that if we focus over here. This is what I think most of the Old Testament does. It just brings us closer but when we look at the gospel narratives, and that's what we're going to do today, we actually see like how the gospel of Matthew brings us into this sort of side, and the gospel of Mark comes at it from a little bit different angle. There's some overlap, like in the gospel of Luke with these other gospels, and then you've got the gospel of John. We're going to go into all four of those and get a robust view of how Jesus met people where they were, especially when it came to the resurrection. I mean, just telling somebody, hey, I believe that somebody 2,000 years ago came back from the dead? We need to give people a little bit of room if they don't just automatically buy into that because his earliest followers didn't buy into that. And so we're going to learn from Jesus how to meet people right where they are. And to do that, we're going to go into the four gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 18, learning and listening to Jesus as he meets people right where they are. And the resurrection story starts this way. This is maybe one of the famous resurrection stories we have. It comes from Matthew, the 28th chapter. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. And suddenly there's this great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. He rolled the stone aside and sat on it. I have always thought that is such a baller move right there. He just comes down, rolls it, and he's like sitting right there. Man. And his face is shining like lightning, his clothing was as white as snow, and the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. That's probably an appropriate response to an angel coming out of heaven. Now, a little side note right here. The reason why there are guards is because when Jesus was crucified and died and was put into a tomb, the leading religious people, they went to the Roman governor, who was like, the big shot of that whole area, and they told them, hey, this guy has been claiming that he's going to come back from the dead, so it's a pretty good bet that his disciples are going to come and steal the body, so you, Pilate, Roman governor, you need to seal that tomb and place some guards at it to make sure that doesn't happen, or else this whole town is going to go into a frenzy. And Jerusalem, where they were at the time, was so swollen with people and travelers because it was one of their biggest festivals of the year, the crowd was already worked into a frenzy because Jesus came in. He's the miracle worker, the prophet, potentially the Messiah. Then they crucified him. Okay, it's all a big deal. It's like, hey, if you don't want this town to lose its mind, you need to make sure they don't steal that body. So they post guards there. And the guards, they fall into this kind of dead faint. And then the angel speaks to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. This is the best news all morning. This is why we're here. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. Come see the evidence for the resurrection. And now, don't just stay there. Don't just look at it. I want you to go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. He's going to meet you. It isn't just, he came back from the dead. Isn't that awesome? Nobody knows where he is. Have a nice day. It's like, no, you're going to see him. And remember what I've told you. I think there was something in what was happening right now that was going to be, how would it be easy to forget that? I don't know. But he says, remember. I don't know. All the things I've forgotten. I don't know if I'd forget that. So the women, they run quickly from the tomb. 
and they are frightened and also filled with great joy. This very well may be the very first time any human being had heard the message, Jesus is back. He's alive. He's not here. And it comes from an angel. And they're still scared. And something's bubbling up in their hearts like, I, I, I don't have a compartment in my brain for what you're saying. And it's terrifying because you're an angel. But I've, there's joy. Joy is rising in my heart. There's this mixture of emotion. So we should never be surprised at how people respond. You got some people in your life who hear this story and they start to get a sense of joy. Their face starts to light up. They, they want to go to church and worship and sing songs. We need to give them a little bit of room to do that. People have been responding to that story, that reality for a long time in that particular way. And then as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. It's no longer just a story from an angel. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. This might be the central verse of every, everything we're doing here today. Many of us, I know this, are running to the feet of Jesus to give him our worship. It is right and good. He is our king. You got somebody in your life who gets a little intense about the things of Jesus, give him a little bit of room. Him coming back from the dead is a big deal to us. Next verse. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid. In the midst of their worship, he says, don't be afraid. There, there's a mixture there. And then he tells them, hey, I'm, you have to go, keep going to Galilee. <laughs> Tell my brothers and you'll see me there. And so what I want to do uh, today, for those of you who have been at Forum for any number of years, you know we love charts at Forum. And we're going to do a little bit of a chart today just to illustrate all the various responses that we see. And so this is going to represent the resurrection of Jesus the, the cross, the tomb, and the resurrected Jesus making appearances. And we see in one of the very first accounts a mixture of things. And this might be an encouragement to you as you think about your own life and faith and how it has changed over the years. Let me be an encouragement to you today that where you are today in your faith may not be where you are next Easter. You might actually experience a transition from, I don't necessarily know, understand, or believe in any of this stuff, but something's starting to well up inside of me. You might be the first one here next Easter. First service was 7 o'clock today. <laughs> there were so many people, we were so thankful for that, who just came to worship. Oh, man. And when you meet somebody where they are, they might be right here or here. And we're going to see a lot of different responses. What would happen if you just met them in that place? We're going to see how Jesus does this over and over again. Now I'm going to jump into the Gospel of Luke. And he would record, as these women were rushing back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everybody else what had happened. And then he even names, it says, Mary and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what happened. Luke, what Luke records. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men. So they didn't believe it. The first time his closest apostles heard he was back from the dead, they didn't believe it. They had walked with Jesus for three over three years, saw the miracles, saw the demonstration of power, heard him talking about coming back from the dead. The report comes in. They still don't believe it. It is baked in to the resurrection story. And this is one of the things that we're going to see over and over again today, that if you and I wanted to convince somebody of something that happened, just in our life, let's say my wife and I are out on a date and we, we have the best street tacos in Colombia. It's Don Poncho's. And while we're there, <laughs> <laughs> and while, while we're there, and we have this experience, and then we, we leave Don Poncho's, and people are like, oh, what did you guys do? I was like, oh, we went on a date. We went to Don Poncho's. It was the best we've ever had. And they're like, I don't like Don Poncho's. <laughs> would, would their unbelief change the fact that Don Poncho's are the best street tacos? The answer is no. It would not <laughs> change that. They do not, uh, they're not endorsing any of the message today, so... 
But if I were to try to convince you, and I just told you, hey, here's something that's the best, here's something that's happened to me, but nobody believes it, that wouldn't be very convincing. So this moment, the, the single greatest moment in human history is being introduced to the world through unbelief. That might be an encouragement to us, not only in the validity of the scriptures, but also to meet people right where they are, especially in their unbelief. That isn't the time to, to lash out against them, to overlay expectations, or to turn away from them. Maybe that's the very place that we lean into. Watch what happens next. Peter hears the story and then jumps up and runs to look at the tomb. Stooping in, I think that's what all of us would do if we got to a tomb, the stone had been rolled away, and we heard a story that there was nobody in there, we would do what Peter does, and we're like, is anybody in there? Like, hey, you have a flashlight, I want to look and see. <laughs> he peered in, he saw the empty linen wrappings, and then he went home again, wondering what had happened. Not believing in what had happened, wondering. And there's, there's a way to, to look at this in its original language, Luke, written in the language of Greek, we can look at that word that he uses, and this is a word that means to be, to be perplexed. Like, I don't, I don't have a box in my brain to put what's happening, and so there's a kind of wonder right there. Now, there's another gospel writer by the name of John, maybe one of the closest friends and followers of Jesus, along with Peter, and when he records this story, different vantage point, different time frame to a different audience, he says, at that moment, Peter and the other disciple, that's him talking about himself, they started out for the tomb, and I love this, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Isn't that exactly how you would tell that story? Like, oh yeah, we had a foot race, and I totally destroyed Peter. <laughs> he stooped in and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in until Peter showed up. Peter went inside and notice the linen wrappings lying there. And the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And then he has to just say it one more time. And then the disciple who had reached the tomb first <laughs> also went in and he saw and believed. This is the same moment. Different reactions. I mean, if you, you think of, of something that you experienced, an event a program you were a part of, any event, whether it was a meal that you had or a time with a friend or a loved one, and then independently asked to tell that story. You're going you're gonna to see it from a little bit different ex experience. You're going to maybe get all the same, like, main core details the same, but that perspective's going to be different. Like, I won the foot race perspective, and that's all that I needed. I needed to see where he was in order to believe that he's alive. That's the same moment. And so you, you might be in this service right now and be responding to the gathering in a way like God is doing something powerful in your heart. Let's give people a little bit of room. They might be sitting next to you and they walk out of day and it's like, oh, I'm so glad that's over. Just meet them right there and go, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I had a different experience maybe today. Now I'm going to jump back into the Gospel of Matthew. So as the women are on their way, so they're on their way back to tell the guys, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. This is often an overlooked detail in the resurrection story that these Roman guards actually become, for this little brief moment, they're little evangelists, they're little preachers, they're little missionaries. We got to go tell some people what would happen. Now, that is actually one of the most beautiful ways to talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We just share the news of what we have experienced, what we have witnessed. We're not trying to propagate a mythology or we need everyone to believe what we believe. We just get to share the story of how God has transformed things. They got to tell the story of an angel coming down out of heaven and rolling away a stone. And then all of a sudden, we're like fainting. And when I came to, I heard this language just talking to these ladies. And they're going to run and tell us like, hey, we just thought you guys should know that we... We failed at our job, maybe? <laughs> and so the leading priests, this is an opportunity for those who just days before were screaming for Jesus' crucifixion. That was the religious people saying that. So they decide, let's, let's call a meeting of all the bigwigs. And they decided in that meeting to give the soldiers a large bribe. That is a strange way to respond to the story of the resurrection. 
the text goes out of its way to tell us that surrounding Jesus' resurrection, there were bribes, and they told the soldiers, you, you got to say, here's what you need to say. Here's the story. We need you guys to repeat back to us so that we know you're going to say it right. You must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. That was the very reason they were posted there, and now they got to go tell everybody, sorry, we failed our job. Now, that would have put them under great threat to their bosses, and so they then come in and say, hey, and if you think, listen, if you're going to get in trouble, we're going to stand up for you so that you don't pay the penalty for that, so that you don't get in trouble. This actually gives us a window and insight into how much influence these religious leaders had with these Roman officials. So the guards accepted the bribe, and they said what they were told to say, and the story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell that story today. We think Matthew writing in the mid-first century, just decades after the resurrection, telling the story, he's like, people are still telling that lie, and we all saw him. So what surrounds the resurrection story? Well, a mixture of things. Bribes and lies. <laughs> Man, if you wanted somebody to believe something, you might not include that part of the story, but the gospel writers do. Now, right around the same time, we're still early on Sunday morning. And if you've ever wondered, why do the Christians gather on Sunday morning? It's because of the resurrection of Jesus. We have been gathering to celebrate that truth ever since it happened. Isn't that amazing? 2,000 years later, we're still doing the same thing. So good. Thankful to be with you guys this Easter. So you got these two disciples, and they're leaving Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus. It's like seven, eight miles outside of Jerusalem. And as they're walking, so we're going to see this in a second. They have heard the stories already that he's back from the dead, but they're leaving Jerusalem. They've abandoned their apprenticeship to Jesus and are going home. And they're on their way to Emmaus, and they're talking about all these things that are happening, and then all of a sudden, somebody starts walking with them, and it's Jesus, except they don't know it's Jesus. God is supernaturally preventing them from recognizing the identity of Jesus, and Jesus asked them, what are you guys talking about? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then listen, one of them, Cleopas, replied, you have got to be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here the last few days. I love this. This is Jesus. Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> what things have happened? <laughs> The things that happened to Jesus. Look into how, listen to the story they tell about who Jesus is. Jesus, the man from Nazareth, a prophet who did powerful miracles and was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all people. A man from Nazareth who did a lot of miracles and he's a powerful teacher. And our leading priests and other religious leaders, they handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We were hoping that he was the Messiah. This gives us a window into where they were in that moment. Where does Jesus meet people? This story is, is part of my story. Like I was on a road away from Jesus. I heard those stories. Nah, I'm going this other way. And I am so thankful he met me on that road. A good encouragement to us. When we start talking about Jesus coming back from the dead, let's be encouraged. Let, maybe we should learn from Jesus to meet people right where they are. This all happened three days ago. And then, and then we heard from some of the women in our group and the followers at his tomb earlier that morning. They came back with this amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told that Jesus is alive. Oh, okay, that is an amazing report. He's alive, and an angel told us. And some of the guys ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. They had eyewitness reports from people that they trusted and loved. You ever share your story about what God has done in your life and somebody close to you, and they don't believe you? That can hurt deeply. Remember, Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus. Be a good reminder for us. And it's from that moment on, Jesus begins to explain how all of the scriptures point to him. That's why we believe that. Because he said that about himself. 
It's like all of this was pointing to me. Don't you know that? And they walk a little bit further and they sit down to share a meal. Jesus breaks bread and gives thanks for it. In that moment, their eyes are open and they know that it's him. And then he he disappears from their presence and they look at each other. It's like, didn't we like somehow know that deep in our bones? Something was burning in us. Watch how their story changes. Within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. So they're leaving, and now they've done a U-turn. Oh, we got to tell some people. And there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them. And then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. Look at what Mark records right here. And as they rushed back to tell the others, nobody believed them. It happened again. Nobody believed them. The resurrection story is surrounded by unbelief. Unbelief from his followers. Right? Now, I want to stop here just for a second. Press pause. And just let's, let's just use this, this story in the road to Emmaus to consider what, what this might look like for us, maybe to look at where we are in our life and faith, maybe even to think, how would I even talk to somebody about what God has done in my life? And this is a, an easy question to ask somebody. If you're here today and you, you're not bought into any of this and you're just here for the free lunch that Grandma promised... It's nine o'clock. Oh, lunch is so far away, my friends. <laughs> we can do it. We can make it. We can make it. Actually, there was some candy out in the, in the grass outside. Kids, did you notice that candy? You should take that candy because if you don't, I'm totally going to eat all of that candy. That is not a joke. That's for real. So if you've got somebody in your life who gets really intense about the things of Jesus, I genuinely want to encourage you to ask them, Why? Like, ask them to tell you, tell me the resurrection story from your perspective. And to all the believers in the room, if somebody in your life that you love and care for but doesn't align with all of your beliefs, if they were to ask you this question, what would you say to them? I think maybe we'd find ourselves in a little bit in that story. We might be like those guys on the road to Emmaus and say, here's what happened. And we might be able to. I know a lot of you in this room, you could, you could probably quote many of the verses that we've already gone through here today. You might tell the story of what happened all those years ago. And my encouragement to you, my fellow believers in the room, is to include with that story what our friends on the road to Emmaus did. They turned around and they went and told the story of how they had experienced Jesus. Don't just share with people the facts of what you know. Share with them your experience of the resurrected one that you love. Let that be a part of your story. I know my prayer for us this Easter is that we would be quick to share the transforming work that God has done in our life as we meet people right where they are. So let's jump back into the message Luke records that just as the guys are telling the story about it, Jesus now is suddenly standing there among them. (laughs) For many of them, it had just been a story up to this point. They had only heard the news. And Jesus says to them, peace be with you. The whole group, listen, they are looking at Jesus after having heard now multiple accounts. This is the first time they're hearing the story. And they're startled, frightened, and thinking they were seeing a ghost. That word in, in the Greek is the word for spirit. They, they thought they're seeing something that's not tangible and real. They're, they're seeing something. Ah, this isn't real. And then he asked them, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Where does Jesus meet them in this moment? (laughs) In their fear and in their doubts. After having heard the story multiple times. That's where he meets them. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. 
you can see it's really me. Hey, it's me. Touch me. Put your hands on me. I am not a ghost. Ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. Spirits don't have flesh and bone like I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet, and they stood there in disbelief. Like, I can't believe what's happening. And this word is a little bit different than unbelief. It's disbelief. It gets us closer to that language that that was used of Peter when he saw the evidence and he just wondered. He stood there puzzled like, I can't make sense of this. If you got somebody in your life or that's where you are right now in your faith, you just cannot make sense of it all. You are in good company. But where you are today may not be where you are tomorrow or next week. What would happen if we leaned into these places and realized God does not condemn you in that place? That's where he meets us. Disbelief, joy, and wonder. And then he asked him, do you guys have any Dom Ponchos to eat? I'm super hungry. <laughs> I, have, I love these little moments in the text. It's so real and so gritty. And I mean, I can imagine them going, is he serious? Is this another metaphor? I don't understand. <laughs> No, give me a cheeseburger. I'm starving. Fear, doubt, disbelief, and wonder. They're looking at him. But there was another one of the disciples named Thomas. He wasn't there when that happened. And so they told him. This might have been the third story Thomas had heard from the women. They might have heard the story of the guys from Emmaus. And now they're like, Thomas, you're never going to believe this. And he's like, you're right. I will not believe it, (laughs) and I won't until I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers in them, and place my hand in the wounds in his side. Good at you, Thomas. I find myself right here, heard the stories, grew up in the home, went to the church, and rebelled against all of it. I need to see the evidence. I'm just, I think God has just wired me to need evidence. I'm not just going to believe it because my parents said so. I'm not just going to believe it because some guy on a platform with a microphone and a Bible says so. I'm not going to believe it just because two billion people gather together to celebrate something. They're probably all delusional. It's literally what I used to think. They've all been tricked. And I would have told that story until I met Jesus. And the evidence, the overwhelming avalanche of evidence in my life, I don't, I don't care what you say. You'll never convince me otherwise. So convinced of it, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I should spend the rest of my life telling people that this is real. Because if it's real, y'all, we got to tell some people. There's a kind of hope, a forgiveness, a life that you can have. God wants us to experience that. We get to, we, wait, I get to share that? After all the things that I did, all the things that I said? Wait, I get to go right back to those same people that I walked with in doubt and skepticism and railed against the Christians? Now I get to go back in there and bring light to that place? No way! So good! So good! He didn't believe. Okay, there's a lot of this going on. There's not so much of this happening. (laughs) Maybe we need to give people a little bit of room to be where they are. Eight days later, the disciples are together again. Guess where Jesus is going to meet Thomas? He's going to meet him in his unbelief. His staunch, I need evidence, not going to check my brain at the door. I don't care how many of my best friends tell me something. I'm not in until I see the evidence myself. I like that about Thomas. Jesus is standing there again. Peace be with you. You know what Jesus does when he walks into a room? He brings peace. As his followers, let that be an encouragement for us this Easter. Let's stop bringing war with us everywhere that we go, fighting everybody who doesn't think like we do. Jesus didn't do that. Peace be with you. Hey, Thomas, here you go, man. It's super gross, but put your finger here. (laughs) And then he says, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. You know what happens to Thomas? He confesses his faith, my Lord and my God. That is a beautiful response to the real life risen Christ. 
You may be with somebody in your life right now that you've been praying for for years. Moms and dads, listen, you may have a kid that's on that road leading out. It's far away. Yeah, they may be moments from this. Don't give up hope. Jesus doesn't. Meet them where they are. Maybe let go of some of those expectations about where you think they should be and just meet them where they are. Bring peace with you into that place. And let's with hopeful anticipation. Oh, long for these days. Maybe this is good for all of us. Maybe this is what we need to do today as we worship. Just fall at the feet of Jesus and say, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. There is a blessing according to Jesus for us today when we believe without putting our hands in that hole. So Thomas is this great example of going from unbelief to confession and belief. I want to take just one more pause here just for a second and just ask you genuinely, This might be a good question to ask that friend in your life who you love deeply, but they don't align with you on what you believe. Ask them. Use me. Blame me. The preacher on Easter Sunday said I could ask this question. What evidence would you need to believe somebody came back from the dead? That's a big thing. You ever seen somebody come back from the dead? A single person ever? Nope. Why why do you think people are just going to believe that automatically? His disciples didn't. He showed up and they're like, "Mm, I don't know. (laughs) We shared this story with somebody. We should not be surprised if they're like, yeah, I don't know. Thanks for the invitation. But I'm not getting up that early. (laughs) And let let me ask you, the Jesus followers, why do you believe he came back from the dead? What evidence do you have? Why? I learned this from my dad years and years ago. So thankful. He said to me, it's not enough to just know what you believe, but why you believe it. And it's the why behind what we believe I think so many people are looking for. There's a lot of what's to believe out there. And I would say this world right now is clamoring for our attention, telling us what to believe without ever telling us why. Because if he came back from the dead, that's the thing. (laughs) We might consider why we believe that. Just a few more. So we're back into the Gospel of Matthew. Then the 11 disciples, they leave for Galilee. Remember that? That was the first announcement from the angel. Going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, when they saw him, this is again, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Are you serious? Do you see this theme? (laughs) It's teaching us something. Some people will interact with Jesus in a way it just pulls worship out of them. You may have somebody in your life right now, you may label them as a little intense or a little churchy or too religious. You might give them a little bit of room because when it comes to a resurrected Jesus, I don't know what else to do but worship him. Give me some space right there. I'll give you a little space for where you are. And we get to see worship there. There's a mixture there. And if that's where you are today, something's bubbling up inside of you, but you got a lot of doubts, listen, you are welcome in this place. Let's work through those things together. All right, just one more, I promise. Then Jesus, from there, leads them to Bethany, and lifting up his hands, this is the ascension, he blesses them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. And so they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. I know this is the heart posture of many in the room today. What a privilege it is to worship alongside of you. Filled with great joy. And they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. Oh, what a good encouragement to us. What if we didn't just celebrate the resurrection on this Easter morning? What if it was just the way that we lived? What if we got to invite people into a way of living? And so I want to come back to that idea of giving just people a little bit of room. I think, I think, I think the biblical narrative really encourages us to give people a little bit of room and to see how Jesus meets people everywhere that they are. It's my story. 
I know that's the story of many of you here with us today. And it might be a part of your unfolding story. Maybe now is just the beginning of. And there's something beautiful when we meet people where they are instead of where we think they should be or where we wished they would be. I think sometimes those desires we have for our friends and family members and neighbors, it's right and good. We'd either wish they'd stop talking about Jesus or we wish that others would start talking about Jesus. But what if we just met them right there? It gets a little bit easier to listen to people and to see people as they are when we can listen to them. And I'm just saying, right now in our world today, this is becoming a very high commodity. We are being convinced that if somebody doesn't agree with you or believe like you, they're wrong and don't talk to them. That's a lie. We can learn a lot from people who don't think like us. We can learn a lot from people who don't believe like us. And I think many of us are missing out on some of the greatest relationships in our life right now because we have said, oh, you don't believe what I believe. And and we don't meet them there. We reject them there. Let's be, what, what if the Christians, what if the Jesus followers led out in this modern era at what it means to listen and to love people right where they are? Because do you know who those people are that you're sitting next to? Do you know those people in your life who have, have not believed that story no matter how many times they've heard it? Those are people that Jesus died and rose for. Did you know that? That's how he sees you. He sees you through a lens of love and loves you enough to say, I don't want you to stay there. Come with me. I'll meet you in your unbelief, but I'll challenge you to believe. You need evidence. Uh, He will give you an avalanche of evidence if you are willing to open your eyes and your hands to receive that. And in that place, what if if the world that surrounds us could look to us and go, oh, those people love really well. I don't believe in that Jesus stuff, but man, there's something about how they love. That might be the beginning of a new life for somebody. And this is going to be our prayer this Easter that he might help us become these kind of Easter people who meet people right where they are, just like Jesus did. Would you guys pray with me? We're going to come to the table of Jesus here in just a second, so I want to begin to examine our hearts. Oh God, we, we are so thankful to be able to worship today. And we want to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor We today are falling at your feet, King Jesus, and proclaiming your resurrection until you come again. Search our hearts. Stir stir within us something deep that we might proclaim your victory over death, that that story might become our story, that we might be the ones who could go and tell of all the good things that we have experienced and heard and seen. Soften our hearts to help us meet people where they are, as you did. That we might love them like you do. People worthy of dying for. We celebrate that today. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for King Jesus. We pray this all in his name. Amen. Amen. The night before Jesus died, he gathered his 12 closest friends and followers, his disciples, in the upper room and he set up what we God's people would do for generation upon generation to remember him by and that's the Lord's Supper and then we're going to have that together in unison in just a moment so get it out and ready it's a beautiful moment but even that night in the upper room with his disciples there was a wide range of responses to Jesus We see Peter like denying Jesus to let him wash his feet and then like the drastic response to then say, oh, Jesus, wash all of me. Jesus says, no, your feet is enough. Uh, And then we see like two brothers squabbling and arguing about which one of them is the greatest in the kingdom. And we also see Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And what's interesting is regardless of where each individual was in their faith or belief in who Jesus was, whether from like wild Peter all the way to the betrayer, they were all welcome to his table. 
Jesus welcomed them all. And Easter is a beautiful reminder that we are all welcome to the table of Jesus. Isn't that exciting? And so for the believers in the room, those that are following him, just be encouraged to know that you are welcome. And for those yet to put their faith in Jesus, those yet to follow him with your life, I want you to know now and forever that that invitation is for you, that he loves you and he wants a life with you. Though you may not be partaking of communion today, know that invitation is always there for you to come to him. He has open arms and he loves you. So let's have communion together in this moment. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement that's confirmed with my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. invite you to stand once again as we celebrate the fact that because Jesus paid it all that we experience freedom and we experience life. I hear the Savior say thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Son of the living God. He died and rose again. He died and rose again. He died and rose again. I took to him my Lord and Savior. He is my Lord and my Savior. He is my Lord and Savior. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left to cleanse and stain, but he washed in white as snow. Oh, he washed in white as snow. He washed in white as snow. With great joy, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, united with Jesus. And raised to the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead.
Praise be to God that because Jesus paid it all, that our debts are covered, our sins are washed clean, and we get to experience new life. It was a joy and a gift to get to witness those baptisms from the past year, and today we get the joy of witnessing a baptism. So if you would direct your attention to the baptistry. Good morning. This is Maddie. She's in seventh grade, and she couldn't picture a better time and a better day uh, to be raised to a new life in the day we celebrate our Lord and our Savior Jesus raising from the dead. Um, <laughs> when I talked with Maddie, she said she was ready to make a change in her life, and she knew that Jesus was the one who can change her and transform her into the woman that he created her to be. And so, Maddie, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. He died and rose again. And I believe in Him as my Lord and Savior. Based on your confession of faith, and I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ. Raised to a new life. Woo! nothing better is there as you go out this morning receive this blessing from the apostle paul to the church of ephesus peace be with you dear brothers and sisters and may god the father and the lord jesus christ give you love with faithfulness may god's grace be eternally upon all who love our lord jesus christ we will see you all soon